federal agents have taken into custody a man they suspect as the Unabomber. This drama is unfolding outside the tiny town of Lincoln, Montana. Say Kaczynski has lived here for about 18 years in his cabin down a dirt road. Today, the FBI sealed the area off as they searched his property. Those who have gone to his place say it has no indoor plumbing, no electricity, that he grew his own vegetables, and had scores of books. Gene Udarian went there as a census taker and found a pleasant but reserved man. Reclusive, hermit type, you know. Uh, he didn't go out of his way to make friends or anything like that, you know. It wasn't a, what you would call a social person. Dinner in Hell Band! Oh, would you listen to them play? Oh my god, I'm looking forward to their private clinics they're putting on for the people, the, the followers. They have their own followers. It's yeah, embarrassing. It's, it's a source of contention with us here on the program. They are more Twitter followers than us. It's our show. It's our audience. Oh, oh, they're just the best. Can't believe they're back out here again. Incredible. Welcome back for another exciting edition of the Dinner in Hell podcast, the show where two amateur historians talk about the atrocious underbelly of history. I am one of your co-hosts, Brad the Impaler, and with me, as always, Ron Maiden. That's right. Thank you, Brad the Impaler. Welcome to the North American podcast, Dinner in Hell, where we do discuss history's atrocious underbelly. We um, have for 76 episodes. This is episode number 76. Would you like to do the entire podcast in NPR voice? Thank you for tuning in to our show. And if this is your first time, this is not this is not normally what we do. Is it? <laughs> I don't Brandon? think we, we no. couldn't keep it up. There's no way. Oh, my God. Man, what, what, what I, are you going to do? I don't drink an extra large coffee on the way here. To talk like that. Yeah, we I'm can't amped. take it. Yeah. I'm amped because we're going to talk about someone who's still alive. Yes, yeah, somebody who is still alive to this day. What was the last subject we talked about that is still alive? Is Picton alive? I think, believe so. Picton the pig man. Our people in Calgary know who we're talking about. The Canadian serial killer. Yeah, good old Willie Picton. Is that the last one? Manson's I, must be. dead. Manson's dead. Yeah. Huh. Dahmer, he's long dead. Freaking Julius Caesar's dead. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, that's true. We only talked about him on the pirate episode. Yeah. Right? Uh-huh. We've never given Julius his own show. Not, oh, I don't know if there's enough there. We'll go find blood. We'll go look for blood, and we'll find blood. Freaking today, though. We're usually, t- it's usually there to find. That's for sure. Today, this is not our first nerd subject. This guy is a complete nerd, you guys. I'm talking bookworm. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. This guy was like a freaking math genius. We're talking about Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber. Mm hmm. Now, well, why? It seemed like you thought there was something mutually exclusive between bookworm nerds and <laughs> math geniuses. I don't know. I'm just saying he was very smart. Nerd, smart. I'm just kidding. I, I don't believe nerd means smart nerd person because, like, I would say I'm a nerd when it comes to, like, Star Wars or Tusken Raiders. I'm a nerd about that or but, turtles. But now that we exist, it, we're OG, Ron and I, uh, in our nerddom. We were nerds when fucking there were no comic book movies in the theaters. Fucking nobody would have known who the hell Thanos was. I could tell you that much for sure. No. And if you brought up Thanos... Might have got your ass beat. I never heard of Hawk, the Hawk, Nighthawk, who flies around, Avenger. He's got wings. He's a black guy, black gentleman. Mm. Nighthawk or Hawk wing, wing or something. I never heard of him or the dude with the bow and arrow. Fing. Hawkeye. Don't know. Never heard of him. Mm-hmm. Like, I would have never heard of none, of none of those guys. I heard of Daredevil. I've heard of Batman, Aquaman, DC shit. You know, the stuff that was on after school cartoons. I'm just saying now we exist in a world where the number one sitcom is the Big Bang Theory. Really? I'm pretty sure. I know at least it was for a while. Hmm. But nerdy shit's like a mainstream now. This guy. Oh, that's a nerd show where they're all nerds hanging yeah, out? Yeah, they're okay. like physicists. I mean like. The, uh, Sheldon. 
exactly what I'm talking. That's the nerd I meant when I was talking about the Unabomber. That kind of nerd, like smart, like yeah, yeah, genius. Yeah, not like uh, me. Basically, is what I'm trying to say. No, no, no. Different type of nerd altogether. Exactly. Yeah. This would yeah. be like Webster's Dictionary nerd. Like uh, Stephen Hawking. Uh, Big nerd. time nerd. One of the greatest nerds ever. Yeah, all timer. That's what, for sure. No, it was Unabomber was U N A B O M B E R. Correct. But the I thought it was U N I because it was meant like university because he was bombing universities. Mm-hmm. That's because the original acronym, once the FBI takes over this case, is U N A B O M. So like it's not oh. really the Unabomber, it's the Unabom case. U N oh, from like university. The file name? Yeah. U N from university, A for airline, and B O M for bombings. Mm-hmm. Unabom. Yeah. Yeah. And then the once the no. media got a hold of that, yeah. they just called them the Unabomber. They're never gonna be able to crack this code. Unabom. <laughs> Yeah. They just cut off the B. They're just like, uh, it sounds like Er. Just put Er on there. Unabomber. We got his name. Which is a really shitty name as far as these kinds of people go. Especially because he openly named himself as Freedom Club. So why the hell didn't they just call him Freedom Club? I'll tell you why. Because no one knew he was leaving that FC tag with all his shrapnel. Yeah, that's So that true. was the way he was identifying himself with the oh, Yeah, so they couldn't release that. Yeah, so they were like, no, you're going to be a Unabomber. Just like, they probably give you a name that you don't like, so you're like, god damn it, it's not Unabomber. Yeah. Like, come out of hiding. Yeah. It's not the Which son of did. Sam. he did. He sent letters. Uh, well, so, so spoiler alert, Ted Kaczynski, Theodore Kaczynski, the Unabomber, was responsible for a series of bombings in the United States under the moniker of Freedom Club, an organization of one, just him. <laughs> really? Yeah. I mean, he didn't have many friends, um, of none, in fact, <laughs> zero. As an adult. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, and Huey, well, he was bombing people throughout the mail and just dropping them off by hand from 1978 to 1995. Has a long career. I remember when he was caught. Me too. Yeah. I remember uh, seeing, anytime I saw somebody with a hoodie and sunglasses being like, fuck, is that the fucking Unabomber? <laughs> That's what he wears all the time. That's yeah. the Unabomber. Like I said, in 1995, I was a 10. So like in the whole manhunt, I was like a child. You know what I mean? Yeah. So every time I saw it, like basically, I saw the Unabomber, and I was like, "Has anybody considered that that might be Weird Al Yankovic?" Or like Joel, just saying, Joel Elliott from Def Leppard, the singer. Yeah, like with sunglasses and a hoodie up. Yeah, like, but anytime I saw anybody with sunglasses and a hoodie, I'd be like, uh, "Mom, mom." Especially when they drew the Unabomber with the full sleeveless British flag T-shirt, I thought, <laughs> "Joe Elliott, man, why doesn't anyone see this?" <laughs> like, boy, it's so obvious. Singing, he was humming "Photograph." God damn it. I'm a threat, he said. I'm just kidding. <laughs> they heard a stage crew talking about setting up at Madison Square Garden on one of these tapes that he sent in in he, the background. The Unabomber was commonly drawn with sleeveless British flag shirt and a bleach stonewashed ripped up jeans like, pour some sugar <laughs> on me. Come on. I would have believed it of him, except the Unabomber seems smart. Yeah. I don't Unabomber. like this. I don't. I have a distaste for Def Leppard. They're another one they're of my one things of my, I hate. Put them on a list. They're one of my first tapes I ever had. Pyromania. Well, the first tape I bought is from a band I now despise, Aerosmith. Oh, but everyone knows how much we love Aerosmith. We we've shredded them many times. Yeah, I'll go back to that well anytime. Janie's got a gun. It's all about gun laws. You know Janie's stance. Janie's like, you try to take my gun. So tell me about Ted Kaczynski as a boy. He was a boy at one time. Uh, yeah, I believe so. <laughs> I believe off he as did a boy. have the normal human life cycle uh, as they generally tend to go. Polywog boy, adult, <laughs> exactly. pupa. Yeah. So it, before he reached his pupa stage, he was excreted on May twenty second from who's cloaca? Forty two. His mother's cloaca, Wanda. Oh, yeah. She emerged from her lake bed like a mayfly. <laughs> she was alive for one day, and she hatched Ted Kaczynski. It's pretty impressive. That's the life of Wanda. 
That's Wanda's life. Short, but <laughs> the brutality and bitterness of nature. Yeah, that's why he got. He was so angry. He was bombing everybody. It's because of Wanda's. Never got to meet her. Sad. <laughs> but here we go. Well, anyway, born uh, 1942 in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, his parents, Wanda and uh, Theodore, they were working class family, normal family. They eventually moved to the suburbs and. You know, uh, people said they were kind of dope. Like, p- people around them were like, yeah, they were normal, you know, civic minded people who were dedicated to their children. None of the usual shit you hear in uh, the abuse you generally find in people who kill other people. Right. He had a normal upbringing with mom and pa in the house. Yeah, more or less. Was his brother David older or younger? Younger. Okay. Yeah, it's his younger brother. Uh, His parents themselves say that Ted was an ordinary, happy, pretty well-adjusted kid, uh, widely socializing with his peers. Uh, He had a setback, though. He had a a very severe outbreak of hives that forced him into isolation in the hospital. He couldn't be even around anybody else. I believe this internment was, like, months long. Yeah. It was weird back then Mm -hmm. like Uh, medical facilities is a whole different world yeah and not in a less pleasant way Mm -hmm. like imagine being in a hospital bed 24 hours a day for an extended period of time for the invention of cable television right he was reading like piles of art magazine old ladies would bring him in here you go we have one time I was in the hospital for four days with an eye infection Mm -hmm. and these old ladies are like volunteers they come in with like a cart with books and like a see a stack of magazines they were like 50 60 i was like 30 something yeah i go oh man you guys have any arp and they're like what like a fucking spark of like what <laughs> of course you they do old shit i was like just teasing ladies any possible any hustlers <laughs> any swank anything cherry anything I was, I was trying to i was naming every porno mag i could to these old ladies they didn't have any. Yeah, they should have stocked up before they came. I don't know what their problem is. Penthouse forum. It's just the letters. It's the just stories. The letters. Yeah. yeah. I was waiting for the plumber, and then the doorbell rang. Good. My girlfriend was still here. Any every <laughs> single one of those that has ever been shown to me, I've been like, yeah, that happened. Yeah. Really. Oh, really? Yeah. Good. Good story, bro. <laughs> Written by a man. You know? <laughs> so you definitely oh. because what I don't know I, people I don't people love it when they they tune in the dinner in hell and we get into the freaking penthouse forum discussions it was clearly a, talk about the murder scope of a program can we talk about bombing people mm-hmm. thank you well Teddy Teddy the bomber he was not the same after that period of isolation mm-hmm. or at least you know he seemed to go back to normal after a while but it definitely affected him. For sure. Uh, His mother noted that he would go months at a time without showing any emotion whatsoever. None. Although he did later in life uh, always seem to have a special care for caged or otherwise helpless animals. I can beat that. Months? Shit. (laughs) I could probably do a year. I could probably do a few years, probably. Just straight face for like a few years. No anger? That's not an emotion. That's a anger that's is a disease. Anger is a, most certainly an emotion. That's a disease that eats at you from inside. It has to come out. Those two are not mutually exclusive. That's something that talks to you in your mind that no one else hears. Do it. Do it. They deserve it. That's an emotion too. Yeah. Freaking had two cases of turn signal torture today. Today. Just today. I was turn signal tortured twice today. We mentioned that on the last show. We mm-hmm. opened it with it. We did the water torture episode. We started, I, I tricked you and said turn signal torture. Yeah. I was thrown oh by God, that. Twice today. Fuck. That's brutal. I lived. Here I am. They lived too, just so everyone knows. <laughs> well, all right. Back to Teddy Boy. Uh, his schools, all the official records, also basically consider him a completely normal dude. Regular, well-adjusted kid. Uh, One thing, though, like we said, super genius. 
And by that, I mean very literally, 167 IQ. We're talking 0.1% of the population are north of 145. So he is in the 0.1% of smartest people on the planet. That's who we're dealing with here. Dang. I mean, he's on a level with Albert Einstein and Stephen Hawking. Right in there. Right in the 160s. I'm trying to think of other freaking geniuses. I don't know. Well, IQ test isn't very old, so that's where you're going to run into trouble. And a lot of them have Chinese names, so you might not be familiar with them because they were likely not publicized here. Hmm. So, normal kid, but when you're this smart, uh, they tend to move you along a little bit in the pipeline. So he skips the sixth grade, which if I, I remember the sixth grade and I remember that period of my life as being full of change for years. And I imagine I wouldn't have reacted well, much like Theodore to being forcibly put forward. Well, I'm not that smart either, <laughs> but like we're talking about already a kid who's a little weird. Yeah. And he's weird precisely because of how smart he is. Like, how the fuck would that guy relate to me? Well, like, what could I possibly say to him that would be even remotely interesting? Freaking. Be like listening to a little kid talk to you all day. That's what his entire life is. <laughs> when people talk to him? Yeah. It's just like <laughs> everyone's a little kid because he's fucking a brain genius. Super smart. Yeah. Asshole, murderer, definitely. Factual. You gotta make sure I inject that in there. Yeah. So but far, you haven't said one bad thing about him. You just also praised total him. super genius. You just been praising him, completely praising him this whole time. Being a super that's genius is not a compliment. That's like assuring to hear you say to, to make make it known that he was in fact an asshole. Yes. Yeah. The the good ones generally don't get on this program. We did the Hitler episode. We only said his name three times. And yeah. we stopped for the rest of the show. <laughs> I don't even know if it was three. I think we said it twice. Like, hey, we're going to talk about Adolf Hitler. And Adolf Hitler was born, blah, blah, blah. And then from then on, we never no, said No, the Hitler name. episode, we said it a billion times. We didn't say it during the Holocaust oh, three episode run. That's right. The yeah. Freaking. I, I think it, we, we only instituted that rule for like the last half of the second part and the third part. Mm. But we did it. Crystal knocked. We Don't believe like, me? Go listen to every second of that oh, episode run. We learned from that one. Don't ever do freaking Holocaust-based programs anymore. No one wants to hear them. Especially if you're <laughs> supposed to be a comedy show. <laughs> nobody plays that one. Nobody plays... Um, Not a big mind for comedy, the Holocaust. <laughs> nobody plays our Rome, the great something, sack, treatment, uh, terminal descent, Rome yeah. 410. Nobody ever hits that one. I think that one was too conceptual. Needs and, to be more visceral. And no one hits the pirate one, which is like That one's funny. great. I don't know That's why the hell one, nobody's dude. listened to that one. Go listen to the pirate one. Get back to us. Like Julius Caesar is a captive and he tells everyone that's captive. I'm like, you know, I'm going to kill you all after we're, after we get to land. They're like, hey, shut up, dick. And then he kills them all. <laughs> yeah. It's like, tune in. Do yourself a favor. If you've listened to it already, listen to it again. So congratulations on your brilliant decision. Kaczynski. Oh, yep. That's what we're talking about. Unabomber. Let's uh, take it back. Yeah. As a kid, he had friends and shit. He'd hang out and chill. But after the grade skip, they didn't seem to accept him when they were older than him. That's when kind of the, the bullying began and the ostracizing. You heard me, nerd. You're going you're gonna to do my homework. Yeah, shit like that. Exactly. Give me your tater tots. Mm-hmm. And, you know, from this point on, the tater tot list, Ted, right. was described as strictly a loner and as somebody who never under any circumstances engaged in any sort of play. And he was also called old, like an old man before his time. Which yeah, I've often a, said about myself. Like, yeah, I, like, yeah. yeah, again, reiterate it. Ted Kaczynski, not a role model. 
He's an old soul. <laughs> yeah. But I've also described myself as the only person in his 30s I've ever known who could be accurately described as crotchety. You? Yeah. Well, I was crotchety at your age, too, so it doesn't get, like, not crotchety. You will remain, Yeah. as you can see, in my crotchetiness. Exactly. And uh, you, and I, uh, you and I hit, and um, we have early onset crotchety. You, the longer you're alive, the more crotchety you get because you remember it live through it and deal with it more it, yeah yeah i mean i think i was probably 22 before i started to actually hate teenagers it was that <laughs> fucking fast i don't even want to hear them speak <laughs> <laughs> when they start to speak that's when i'm like say another word now freaking eliminate you i look them in the eye and i'll be like look dinner in hell co-hosts Ron Maiden, Fist of Fury. And that's that. <laughs> You're going to knock them all around. I don't know karate, but I do know crazy. <laughs> I don't know what that's from. I didn't make that up. I feel like due to your delivery, it was likely that a woman said this. No, I, I think it's from maybe a movie or something. Some, hmm. I don't know. That's what I'm, I'm women character. I didn't think this was someone in your life and you'd forgotten where you'd heard it from. Uh, no, I don't know. But yeah, if you heard it in a movie, I don't know that movie. So. Well, if it was a movie about high school, Ted nice. did not get <laughs> along that well in high school. Dude, either. I'm going to message your coach and let him know that it's working. The <laughs> lessons. Segue coach. Oh, those, all the workshops you've been attending. Whew. I think the trick is why why it's get finally starting to sink in is because he makes me practice my segues while I'm on a segue. He's like, again. It's and I have to balance <laughs> yeah. the whole time, but I have to be like, well, if down is where you think the NASDAQ's going, that's where I'm also shifting my center of gravity to move backwards. Those are the ty- types of things we worked out. We workshop those. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of workshop, was there a workshop in this high school that Ted was attending? Ooh, ooh, good one. That's what I'm talking about. Answer the question, Impaler. I don't know. No idea. But, I mean, he, he never even got the chance to have an individual personality. He was like a, a curio to everyone, like just a, 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 brain, a brain with legs. He wasn't a real person to any of them. He's like Krang. <laughs> yeah, he's exactly like Krang from the Teenage Mutant like, Ninja Turtles. He's like, ah, I'm going to do this trigonometry. <laughs> ah, Shredder, get those turtles. Yeah, and then everybody piles on the nerd and April his ass. Was April, the O'Neil, name April? <laughs> April O'Neil, the, the reporter. Hey, you at the show. What? This is called size. Uh, I thought they're called like three lit, braided swords. <laughs> three pokers it's called a sign don't you i thought you ain't no nerd anyways speaking of nerds high school is full of nerds isn't it Mm -hmm. especially one ted kaczynski (laughs) a tag team a handoff segue can you believe this that's how we do it we're evolving right now guys the show has just evolved this is like the podcasting equivalent of us both getting triple doubles i see it future episodes us doing this stupid segue shit from now on it's probably gonna stick Maybe sparingly. <laughs> Speaking of sparingly, mm-hmm. there was sparingly a, a time where I didn't skip when I was in high school. And when you skipped in high school, yeah. did you skip the eleventh grade like oh, Ted Kaczynski? He's so smart. Yeah, yeah. We can't. Beat he this graduated shit up. <laughs> early. <laughs> we can't keep beating it up every time. We got to move. Yeah. He graduated early um, and went off to Harvard University in 1958 on his own, a completely now ill-adjusted, weird 16-year-old kid for life on his own. At Harvard with adult kids, men, 18, 19 at Harvard. He's 15 or 16. The future exploiters and false rulers of this nation. You ever seen the movie Skulls? It's all about Harvard. That's about Yale. <laughs> I don't know. I just remember his boys club with some skull shit. You guys freaking do it, man. <laughs> well, I know a few people who would get angry about this distinction. What? 
ridiculously. What Yale Harvard yeah. mix up? Oh, whatever. Sorry. Don't yeah. If you're sensitive. I don't know. I'm sure we have a big amount of listeners that are Ivy League alums. Well and they're getting salty about this right now. We have a big cyber valley. Is that what it's called in California? Cyber Valley? Mm-hmm. We have a real big following out there. I don't know if they're Yale and Harvard, but they're tacky. They're smart in Mountain View. Well, answer us this, Mountain View. If you're from MIT, are you do you smart? like Harvard or do you hate Harvard? Your Cambridge uh, associates there. I've I've always wondered. Uh, but at Harvard, um, he wasn't completely averse to socializing. And I think this is one of the things that makes his story uh, tragic and interesting to me. Is It's like he kept trying over and over and over again to join society and at every step they would abuse him or ostracize him N- none of this ever went well for him and when you're already a little weird and you have just basically this string of bad shitty luck and a couple of bad decisions and if you're this weird already holy shit you're you're off the charts now you're killing people yeah. He's like, you know what? I'm just happier alone. Fuck people. That's why I fish all the time. I'm just kidding. I don't know. That's basically his entire philosophy, more or less. Uh, but it started off okay at Harvard for him. He was in a house with 18-year-old, you know, brightest in the nation, brainy type kids. Mm-hmm. So it's not like he was, you know, at fucking state university with normies he was in like the upper echelons i mean these people were all so smart and young 18 16 is not too different so he was getting along okay when he first got there but sophomore year everything changed you start working on those general education requirements and ted finds himself in a psychology seminar Hmm. and is uh very humiliatingly and excruciatingly experimented upon by his psychology professor, Henry Murray. Now, what this involves was him writing a long series of extremely personal essays that basically outlaid his entire individual outlook on the world, his philosophy on almost everything. He looked up to this professor like he wanted to be this professor. Yes, he was the epitome of the Harvard man. Yeah. And that's what he wanted. I mean, when he you're super him. smart, you want to do really well at your Ivy League school. He spent lots of time with him out of class, one-on-one with him. Yeah, this is, I mean, we're talking 200 hours of this in total every week for the next three years. And after they get your... um your essays and your interviews about what you think, what they do is they sit you down in a chair and they put electrodes on you, you know, to measure your heart rate and your brain responses. Like you got electrodes on you and they say, we brought a panel of experts in on all of these subjects that you talked about. And we're going to take a look at your essays here and we're just going to get your reaction. Like, does that sound good? And then he's like, yeah, he's really excited because everybody's been so supportive up until now. Yeah, he's like a star. Like, oh, this is Ted. This is the boy I was telling you about. Check it out. Mm-hmm. Like, what are you talking about me? Oh, shit. Yeah, but as, Sweet. as soon as it starts, as soon as it kicks off, uh, everything's handed over to an independent attorney. And the attorney, who I imagine is skilled in the art of doing this to get a certain reaction completely demeans and humiliates your philosophy with wide sweeping generalization generalizations too so it doesn't even feel fair verbally decimates him yeah just abuses and humiliates him for an extended period of time completely destroying everything he thinks but in both fair they'll give him fair criticism without allowing him to respond to it And then they'll give him extremely unfair personal criticism. Like, this is wrong because you're so obviously fucking stupid. Freaking, they would... Like, so it's like he can't even really handle... What do you... How do you respond to criticism like that? I mean, you can't. And they just deconstructed him. 
they just b- tore into him with this shit they, for three years. They um, remember the one guy, I think it was the professor, would be like, he read a, this is a letter that your mother sent me. Yeah. Oh, please. Do you have my full permission to do these experiments on Ted since I th- I've been noticing masturbating too much lately. Yeah. And he could really use something to turn him around and like he's been really down and they, to faked, himself. they faked a humiliating letter from his mother. And after they unstrap him and push him out the room, freaking uh, then they start talking like, oh, he's still using that letter bit. Yeah. You know what the hell? It always works like as a total. And that's your dinner in hell going deep dinner in hell going deep we know that ted did not have a great time at harvard but he did graduate in 1962 and enrolled in graduate school at none other than hh holmes alma mater the university of michigan I think that's Notre Dame. <laughs> oh, come on. You uh, have to give credit. All right. Oh, wait, we H.H. Holmes, Murder Mansion, look it up. Hail to the victor's oh, valiant oh, oh, oh. All right, well, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> But you got to give it the right treatment. It is the single greatest fight song in all of college sports. Indisputable. Ask Ted. He'll tell you. Possibly in the universe. I don't hear shit from Mars. Or you? Alpha Centauri. Or freaking Pluto. Yeah. Okay. Where's your fight song? Scientist, Plutonian universities. Scientists revealed that do not laugh at this. If you laugh at this, that means you're probably about nine years old. That Uranus smells like rotten eggs, so it must be like um, methane. No, it was just methane, but sulfur. Meth- sulfur, yeah. Yeah. Oh my god. Well, U of M. Ted goes there and receives two advanced degrees: uh, his master's degree in 1964, and he achieved his doctorate in 1967. So I suppose we should have been calling him Doctor Ted Kaczynski this entire time. Uh, he specialized in complex analysis and geometric function theory, whatever the fuck that means. <laughs> geometric function therapy. You don't, you don't know what that is? Geometric oh. function theory. Theory, right. <laughs> <Yeah>. That's what <laughs> I, I say therapy because to, to people like me and Ted, like other geniuses. It like is myself, therapy. It's more like a therapeutic. <laughs> it's like our minds just see geometry theory like you see, you know, an apple is red. What is complex analysis? Oh, Tony, I don't think we have time to be quite frank with. I think we should just stay on subject as usual. Okay, I'll give it to you. People hate it when we get off track. His thesis was fucking great. It won uh, like the award for the best thesis of that year. And uh, his advisor called it the best thesis that he had ever worked on, you know, including before and since. And on top of that, described the thesis as something that maybe only 10 or 12 people in the world could even understand. I mean, for a a graduate student, that's incredible. The most unbelievable part, like, I'm talking hard to believe part, is like Kaczynski would be in like the bars telling girls, be like, hey, guess who got the freaking number one thesis over here? This guy, the beard. They're like, you nerd. Something tells me by this point, uh, he didn't have the confidence for that type of behavior. Looking at thesis writer over here. Uh Freedom Club. (laughs) Well, he took a job teaching at um, Berkeley in California. As a matter of fact, he was the youngest mathematics professor the university had ever employed. But the students say he taught just like you thought Ted Kaczynski would teach a math class. That is straight from the book, and he refused to answer any questions. Inside a cabin. Come on in here. Everybody cram in. You're Everybody gonna, in this cabin. You're just going to ride a rickety bike for 17 days to get to fucking like Montana. We're... Yeah. Yeah, bud. Wise. Bud. Wise. 
Oh God, not I, I, I haven't heard this in like a decade, and I already, <laughs> already, it's uh, it's too much. It's too big. I'm seeing the T-shirts and then the parody T-shirts. I can't fall into this hole. I'm sorry. We we gotta pull back. We're gonna we gotta get back to Ted. I remember freaking Spuds McKenzie. <laughs> I remember Spuds McKenzie. This is like a bull terrier. Yeah. yeah, fucking little dark, dork dog, dorg. He was a dorg. A dork dog. You know what I'm talking about. Dork dogs, dude. Think of a dork dog you've known growing up. Normal. Total dork. Normal. Normal. No, was Normal a cat? No, Odie was the dog. Yeah, my Garfield dorg. War is all Classic. Odie was a classic example of a dork. Uh, excellent. Excellent. Well, yeah, you heard how shitty of a teacher he was, and he didn't last. He resigned after a mere... Two years, his academic career was extraordinarily short. After a brief stint back at his folks back in Chicago, he moved into an extremely remote cabin that he and his brother had hand-built in Montana. Like a kit. Yeah, we're talking 10 by 12. Actually, not a kit. He planned it to be the most efficient living space for that size cabin. Yeah, the two of them together. Yeah. I'm not sure if I He's mentioned smart. it earlier, but David was also very smart. Not genius level, but very smart guy. He went to like instead of like Harvard, he was going to like community college. He's like, "Hey, I'm doing the best I can, okay? My brother's genius, okay?" <laughs> God damn. Well, I think he was doing all right for himself. I mean, we're talking remote though. And we're talking. They were both into eco, like ecology, into green living. That was a big deal to both of these guys. But this place had no running water, certainly no electricity, and he was really aiming to be self-sufficient. And if you are getting an inclination that his mental state might be a problem at this point in time, well, it is. Let's talk about. When he was back with his parents, he was trying to save up some money. Because, I mean, you can't get by with no money. He was trying to get by on minimal money. Yeah. Like doing odd jobs or stuff, money that he had saved up. So he was working at a foam rubber factory for his brother. His brother was the foreman, like the supervisor. And he had developed an attachment to a female co-worker. Not David. Uh, Dr. Ted had done this. And, I mean, when you ask the this woman later on when she's interviewed about this, uh, she was like, there was no romantic relationship. It, I was never even, like, directly approached. He seemed nice enough, but we barely even spoke. Look, I just wore Daisy Dukes every day with no <laughs> bra and a tank top. Even but- then, the, any kind of behavior towards a woman doing that is unacceptable. That's right. She could wear whatever she likes. It's not an invitation for nothing. Was it um Chris Rock or Chappelle? I think it was Chris Rock that was like, "Fuck! I just dress as a cop, and I'll be walking down the street and like, help, help! There's a, there's, he's being robbed." I'm like, "Bitch! I'm no cop. What's just because I look like a cop? I'm supposed to be a cop." <laughs> like girls that dress like hot or whatever. Yeah, is it one of his bits? I don't. I don't think I saw that one. Yeah. Yeah, well, he had developed an obsession with her, and the the reason he made a, a premature maybe run out to Montana is he was caught by his brother posting up dozens of, like, mean, dirty limericks about this woman, like, around where everyone could see them. Like, he came in and saw him. was like, the fuck, Ted? You got her name in the notes? No. What do you think it was? I Lin- don't know. Linda? I have no clue. I'm just trying to think of a, a limerick real quick that I could come up with. <laughs> oh, trying to, on the spot, limericks. You ever like go downtown Detroit? There's like an after hours club where they do limerick offs. Yeah, the battle like, limericks. Oh, oh my God. It's so freaking crazy down there. It's like barely lit, smoky. Like, oh, coming to the stage, the limerick king of freaking Oakland County. Well, I limerick. know something about you. You got to give Limerick crazy, 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 crazy. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that happens down at the shelter. All the way from Kansas. <laughs> the limerick capital of the bread basket. <laughs> of America. <laughs> I don't know. Limerick <laughs> officer freaking crazy in Detroit, though. I would, love to, Google I would it. love to see one of those. Yeah. Hashtag limerick off. Totally. Uh, yeah, and so David's like, Ted, you got to stop with the limericks. And Ted's like, I'm not going to stop with the limericks. I, the limericks are my thing now. I'm I'm doing this. So David was like, well, then you're fired. He's like, my brother, how dare you? It's like, I'll, yeah. never be- I'll never speak to you again. He feels betrayed by that, but in like reality, it's like, Nah, bro, you made a choice between limericks and your job, and you chose limericks, and you chose wrong. Like, it's your own decision that you don't have a job now. You can't blame this on Davey. Yeah. Yeah. Ted was mad at a lot of things. (laughs) Yes. He was mad at the world around. He's mad at people. He was mad at his brother now, his brother that was like his born blood friend because he didn't have other friends. So now that he has this disconnect with his brother, mm-hmm. now he's just ready to really fucking tear shit up. Yep. So now he's out in this cabin all alone. One day he hikes two days to a favorite spot of his in the nature, this beautiful ravine with a waterfall. And when he gets there, it's swarming with construction equipment and there's like two new roads going in. And that's, I think, what he says really fucks his shit up. And sort of the the straw that broke the camel's back, as it were. I mean, I've got a quote here himself that explains uh, his intentions pretty well. The reason he he decided escaping wasn't good enough and that he needed to act. Uh, he says, they'll take the easy way out and giving up your car, your television set, your electricity is not the path of least resistance for most people. I think that the only way we will get rid of it is if it breaks down and collapses. To a large extent, I think the eco-anarchist movement is accomplishing a great deal, but I think they could do it better. In a general way, I think what has to be done is not to try and convince or persuade the majority of people that we are right, as much try to increase tensions in society to the point where things start to break down, to create a situation where people get uncomfortable enough that they're going to rebel. So the question is... How do you increase those tensions? God, he really lays it out when he says, I think that eco-anarchists are doing a great job, but I think they could do better. He doesn't say it, but coming from him, you know exactly what the fuck he's saying. He's saying destroy. Yeah, he's saying these peaceful protests are nonsense. You need bloodshed. Yeah, you're not... I, you, yeah, getting sprayed with a fire hose in the winter in freaking the Dakotas isn't doing nothing. Mm-hmm. You need to freaking. Yeah, I mean, you can mayhem. call. You can call. Uh, you know, Ted Kaczynski wore a, a lot of hats, I and mean, you could call him a terrorist. You could call him a revolutionary. You could Let's call him he... a philosopher. You could call him a political theorist. I, there's. Any number of labels that apply accurately to this guy. That's one of the things that makes it so interesting. I mean, he's exactly right. I mean, if you want to see a world like he envisioned, uh, the goal, the collapse of society is absolutely a desirable goal. And what I mean, what this shows is he's clearly not an insane person. He understands how this shit works. Because those tensions that he's describing, um, I mean, this is all standard, you know, political statecraft. I mean, this is not ridiculous. All of this is perfectly logical if you have his inclination and you're willing to use uh, violence to see your philosophy put forward. And he does exactly that. On May 25th, 1978. Is this his first? First bombing. Um, This bomb mailed to a materials engineering professor at Northwestern University was like, oh, I don't know what this is. Send it to security. 
And Officer Terry Marker, who opened this package, was injured on his left hand. Um, we're talking pipe bomb. The reason that this bomb didn't do even more damage than it did is the pipe bomb was capped off on either end with a wooden cap, which is something that's pretty goddamn unique to him for his early creations. Mm-hmm. Typically, they're metal. It yeah. seals better, way more pressure when the pipe goes. Okay. Yeah. More sh- shrapnel goes faster, goes deeper, goes through stuff, more mm-hmm. violence in the explosion itself. So that's why this one didn't work so good. I mean, another indication that this was a relatively, for his later work, primitive device is that the ignition mechanism was a nail suspended on rubber bands that would strike match heads when the lid of the box was opened. After this, he targeted airlines, including one bomb that, if it had not failed to go off due to a faulty firing mechanism, would have definitely taken down a filled airliner out of space. Or out of the air, not out of space. He attached a barometer to it so it would go off at a certain altitude. Certain pressure, yeah. Mm-hmm. He like did the math and figured out what it needed to be, which is technically impressive. This would have been by far and away his most devastating attack by a long fucking margin a had it worked. Bus full of people falling out of the sky. Yeah. 200 to 250. I don't know what kind of airliner oh. it was, but there was a lot of people on that plane. I'm sure he picked a plane that was going to be carrying a mass amount of mail and a bunch of people. What a goddamn it, Ted. Um, he sent bombs to John Harris. Another graduate student at Northwestern, which resulted in cuts and burns. Uh, The president of United Airlines uh, suffered severe cuts to his body and face. A secretary at Vanderbilt University takes a load of shrapnel. Engineering professor at Berkeley cuts and burns. Psychology professor and his research assistant suffer hearing loss with burns and some shrapnel wounds. He's letting them rip. But, I mean, he's injuring and maiming a shitload of people, but he hasn't killed anybody yet. I mean, and the airline, the airline attack, too, I, I, should have, I should have noted then, was a federal crime, and that's when the FBI gets involved. Right. Yeah, so they've been on this for, for the beginning, for sure. At this point in the story, we're up to eight, 1985. Um, Kaczynski mails a bomb to a graduate student and Air Force Captain John Hauser. He loses four fingers and the vision in one eye from the explosion of the bomb. 1985, Kaczynski also placed a bomb in the parking lot of a computer store. That bomb, picked up by the owner, Hugh Scrutton. Hey, it's Hugh Scrutton here. If you need computer service, come on down to Scrutton's Computer yeah, come service. Come on down to Big Scrutton. Same day service. Um, no way. You Scrutton. Holy shit. We won't go looking in your files or your folders or nothing. You can trust us. Um, and maybe I jumped in on that, but Hugh Scrutton was the Unabomber's first fatality. Jesus. Yeah, so You're he, joking about Hugh Scrutton's death? Uh, come on. We've, How dare we've you? some funny names on this show. Hugh Scrutton's up there with a lot of them. Hi, this is Hugh I Scrutton. apologize. I personally apologize to the Scrutton family. I'm sorry. Call a record story. Like, Y'all carry Hugh Scrutton? I'm like, oh, let me check the bluegrass country section. Hold Heard on. he's blowing up on the charts. <laughs> Oof. Uh... He hid it as lumber. He disguised it as lumber. Yeah, it looked like a in the computer piece store of, piece of wood. Hey, what's this? Hey, hey, what you looking at, you? What you got there? Got his piece of boom. Why do you hate Hugh so much, Brad? I don't. This is just something that happened. I never knew he's, this. Got a, he's got a funny name. <laughs> I never knew this about you. I, I, I made Passionate. a mistake. It is too funny. It's too recent for me to be making fun of. I should know better, but also. Hugh Scrutton is a funny name, so whatever. Of all the deaths on our show and all the names, you've really punished Hugh for what did he do to you? Nothing. He is a proponent of industrial society, Ron. Just because he makes a living from goddamn computers? 
Evidently. In the mind of uh, the murderous asshole, Ted Kaczynski. Again, I, I feel like he, in other ways he's very sympathetic to me, so I feel like I just need to drop that in every once in a while. Nineteen eighty seven, we jump two years into the future and Ted places a bomb in the parking lot of yet another computer store, this time picked up by Gary Wright. I got nothing for Gary Wright. Um, He's like, I'm li- Gary Wright here, giving guitar lessons down at the guitar shop afternoons. Twelve bucks an hour, mom. Well bring your guitar. Uh, more like Gary wrong. Because when he picked up the also lumber disguised bomb, it exploded, shredding the nerves of his left arm and propelling more than 200 pieces of shrapnel into his body. Never play guitar again. (laughs) No, he most certainly would not have. But I will say that he switched back into Gary Wright, I guess, because he survived and is actually friends to this day with David Kaczynski. David's like, hey, will not stop calling me. Dude, like, well, dude moved into my town. Oh, David reached out to him after the event. Oh, yeah. listen, man. I am, I'm a guitarist myself, and I can, I can understand your loss. I just want you to hear the sweet picking. So I brought you this bongo that you can play with one <laughs> hand. Just tap on that thing. Go, here's a tambourine, too. Just go nuts. Just go nuts. Just go. Just really explore the room with that tambourine. Well, me shit. What are you gonna do? Uh, another prominent victim he got was the PR guy who worked for Exxon, who helped them clean up after their oil Jackpot. spill. Jackpot! There you go. Now we're talking. Yep. Uh, he became Ted's second fatality. Oh, let's look, guys. It's not so bad. Comes home. Parks the Jag, checks the mail. What's this? Yeah, that was his second fatality. His third being the president of a lumber and, uh, you know, timber industry association, like a trade group. See, he's like, check it out, eco anarchist. This is how you freaking do it. You freaking (laughs) eliminate. Yeah, we've talked about some people who uh, are select victims because of random. Yeah. We've heard some who select victims based on psychosexual desire. Yeah. And this is Ted's on a mission. Yeah, he's not just going to s- remove himself from society like Brad said earlier. Yeah, well, it was he's his gonna, first plan. He's going to move. So, sure. He's going to go off the grid. But that's not all. Phase two. This is when bombs go off. Yep. That's exactly what was going on. That's what he's trying to tell these freaking eco anarchists in his uh, letter that he wrote or whatever. The manifesto? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're almost we're almost to there. No, you read it earlier. You said they need to do better. Yeah, they need to do better. Is that his yeah. manifesto? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, no, that was in just him an interview. Okay, there you go. Uh, all in all, 16 bombs. 23 injured and three fatalities, 1978 to 1995. Um, Every bomb, you would hide a metal plate stamped FC, like you said, standing for Freedom Club. Yeah. Uh, He would write to the FBI, including like a special identification code to verify his identity as like the true Freedom Club spokesman. Dear FBI, you think I'm playing FC? Telegram. Mm -hmm. Same with uh, other publications he would write to as well, uh, including the Washington Post. Yeah. Which in 1995, in return for him promising not to commit a bombing that he had threatened, his manifesto, Industrial Society and Its Future, which basically lays out his philosophy of how the development of technology has caused human alienation um, widespread, unnecessary suffering, the disaster that's going on with our environment. And basically, he says everything that's wrong right now is the fault of technology. We hmm. need to go back to... Well, I mean, there's a school of philosophy that's already pretty well developed even before he came along um, 
is generally called primitivist anarchism, mm. which is uh, basically that. Like, civilization was a mistake. <laughs> basically, is their philosophy. We should be living off the land. I mean, Mongolian one, style. Yeah, one thing that I always wondered. I mean, I've read some that say it's just like, oh, we need an egalitarian uh, society free of hierarchy that is based on the foundation of environmentalism. That seems sane to me. There are literally people, though, who think we should go back to a caveman lifestyle voluntarily. I don't know what those people say to somebody who, say, has diabetes. Where are they going to get insulin? Look, here's the thing. Or if you need glasses. This is the thing with insulin and diabetes. Here's the thing. We're not meant to all live. We're not all meant to live forever. Us living to 80 and 90. Nothing is meant. Nothing is meant by anyone for any reason. Like before medicine, like people were living to like 50 yeah, but you know what I'm saying? Evolution produced human beings and human, who who broke free of natural selection. And human, so if anything, us producing insulin is natural because right. our brains are the product of evolution. We naturally inarguably it's most incredible accomplishment. We have naturally improved shit just like the person that invented chocolate. Like the Mm -hmm. person that made butter for the first time, the person that made beer for the first time. Like we're constantly trying to improve our lives with shit, like naturally, like you're saying. Mm -hmm. That's all I wanted to say. That's how I was. That's what I was trying to kept trying to jab in. (laughs) I'm sorry. (laughs) Unibomber gets me a little worked up. Oh, he's oh yeah, I can tell. Already had to change shirts once. Let's break. The audience here gets to actually see us take breaks. That the listeners don't. Yeah, we cut those out for yeah. your... You couldn't handle... It gets a little uh, grim in between takes. We take about 20 breaks per program. We argue so much, so vociferously, that the neighbors, they call the police sometimes. Plus, well, that's bad. Blad Brad's been having a bladder problem. So we've been taking a lot of breaks. Well, suffice it to say that when the you manifesto came out. Nice segue from bladder. We got bladder infection. We're I, going oh, right back to Kaczynski. Sorry, I'm an asshole because I couldn't come up with a segue from bladder to manifesto. I got Hey, look, I'm going to send the good to your coach. I'm going to send that one to your coach, and you're going to be back to square one with him. I, I promise you. Uh, if he fucks with me, he's fired. You're going to be running laps. What am I running laps? The Segway school. Shut up. He, he freaking disciplines you with a Segway form. Like, <laughs> speaking of laps. You're, gonna, you're, you're not going to hear any claps on the next Segway, you say. I'm Speak- definitely not. Oh, it's just going to be a nonstop abuse session like those fucking experiments that our friend Ted suffered. Yep. Yeah, but suffice it to say that the manifesto is not crazy. It is not the work of, like, a ridiculous person. He has a coherent philosophy that he's trying to enact with political actions. Yeah. Just most people, A, disagree with him, and B, really disagree with his methods. All written on an old, like, antique typewriter that's in his cabin. Yeah, you know it wasn't on a computer. He wasn't at the library. He was in his cabin by a fucking kerosene lamp light. Yeah. That's probably what he worked for for the money. He's like, I need a gallon of kerosene. Get me through the season. Probably, yeah. I mean, I don't think he had, like, he didn't have any sheep or anything. He couldn't make his own clothes. If he needed, like, a tool, he had to to buy it. What about fishing string and a hooks? Yeah, shit like that. Yeah, he had to buy shit like that. But once you buy a, a once you, I mean, once you kind of get set up, you're kind of set up. You know what I mean? You, you wouldn't need really much money at all after that. Then you're just replacing stuff as it is broken, which if you take care of stuff, ain't that often. I, mean, I don't know. His lifestyle blew. Nobody wants to live like that. That's what he doesn't understand. Nobody would tolerate that. 
you give me with no you give electricity. Me, you give me his setup, but with running water, electricity, like delivery of tiny house, Kadoba, see, an internet connection. I'm down. Put me in the middle of Montana. I don't give a shit where it is, but I need the internet. It must happen. On our Amirment episode, you made fun of tiny house living. I got a memory like a freaking steel trap. I'm telling you. Are you sure I did, or did you I just say it, it would it. be impossible because I own I a drum set? I don't think you were. Yeah, right. You weren't like saying it, it, you were. You were just goofing on it. Yeah. It oh, wasn't yeah. Like I you, don't. You didn't make a promise. If we're really gonna, if we're really gonna hammer it down, tiny houses are a okay by me. Listen, here's the ideal setup. I think I brought this up too. Like a, a couple tiny houses of you tiny and house like-minded commune. people with a center house that has a kitchen and like a creative room, a soundproof band room, a fucking some uh, video production stu- i'm just kidding i'm pretty sure we did this already <laughs> on an episode that it, same episode you explained to me it's called a uh, cult I'm like yeah I'm like, what <laughs> i'll be well, the, i'm jesus yeah you I, guys I, get, I call new jesus listen i'm gonna take the burden of sex for all so all the men have to be celibate but me that's R- uncle ronson talking now i don't know if david had any kids so i don't know if we can call him uncle ted but we can call him Doctor Ted. You know who else didn't have? You know who didn't have kids? Definitely Ted, because he, as far as I understand, is still a virgin. That's right, to this day, by a woman. He has been in prison. <laughs> Just sorry. Yeah, but with people who are like older and weaker than him. Oh. Although they do say once he was in prison, he struck up a pretty amiable friendship with Timothy McVeigh before he got executed. Oh, I bet. Well, the manifesto ended up being his downfall. That's what put him in the prison. When David got an eyeball on that manifesto, he was like, oh, fuck, it's probably Ted. It's probably Ted doing the bombs. This is Ted's writing. Yeah, he was. they were pretty sure. Yeah, David's old lady put him up to it. Yeah, the old lady would read it and said, "This sounds like your brother." He's like, "No," and then she's like, "This is definitely your brother, dude. Come on, no, like you think there's another person who's like this out there?" Yeah, yeah. So eventually, and this is a whole rigmarole with like a lawyer, and then they got outed. He tried to remain anonymous, but he did report it to the FBI. It should be noted that also there was a one million dollar award for a tip leading to the arrest of the Unabomber. I think he wanted to not somehow he wanted to be protected. He didn't want Ted to know. First of all, he loved his brother. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it was. David's a good, good guy. It seems like even the, the reward that he got was donated to a fund for the victims. Like David deserves no blame in any of this. Imagine sitting in your living room, your um, David's wife. You're sitting in your living room. It's a nice day out. It's mm-hmm. quiet. You got your show on or whatever. And all of a sudden, in an instant, uh, 10 news vans pull up in front of your house and put their satellite antennas up and they're staying. Yeah. And they want to interview you and Dave. Like, how the fuck? Like, he's trying to be anonymous and like, not let his brother know. And all of a sudden, every news van was there. Like, what the hell? FBI is supposed to be private. Oh, and they're basically middle class. I mean, they're not rich yeah. people. Were they living in Chicago or DC? I thought it was DC. I think that's where they were at that D- point in time. DC? Yeah, or in that area. DC. Yeah, that's where they had moved to by then. Yeah. Because David was originally planning to like live a similar lifestyle to Ted. That's what kind of caused a little bit of a rift between the two of them because David was like. Oh yeah, that was like a fun thing that we used to talk about. But like, I got a woman now, and I'm want to have a, like want to settle down. Yeah, yeah. That combined with the work of the FBI's behavioral analysis unit and the development of uh, forensic linguistics from scratch, uh, trying to figure out who he was by his language and shit like that. Those, Key phrases that he would type. Yeah. Uh huh. They referred to it as his idiolect. Like a dialect specific to an individual. Theoretically, you can recognize it just like a fingerprint. Yeah. Um, and they showed that to be uh, pretty effective in the long run. Uh, combining those two things led to a search warrant that allowed them to search Ted's cabin. 
in Montana. There was no issue with like him getting a delivery from like FedEx or UPS. Nothing like remember like Waco, like oh, there's grenades rolling around in a box. No, they were able to successfully. Well, think about it. Even if you are a friend of Ted's, which didn't exist, even if you were over the next hill, which they were not far away, uh, if you see the command center, you can't call him. And he hadn't, at this point, he was holed up. He hadn't been outside for more than a couple minutes at a time in like months because they were watching him before they got the search warrant. Yeah. So there's no way anybody could warn him, and there's nobody who would have any interest in warning him. He's completely isolated, just like he wanted, but that has some consequences against him, too. He can't see it on TV. He can't hear it on the radio. He, there's no way of knowing unless he physically sees or hears them with his own eyes or ears. It's the only way he'll ever find out. So... They ran the manifesto in the paper. They did. And he rode his bike to the local library. Yeah, he would like, do that sometimes. And there's like cars all in the parking lot. It's like, why is it so busy? She's like, the librarian is like, she's like, it's going to be busy all day. The paper came out with the Unabomber's manifesto in it. And he's like, like he drops, passes out. Ted, what's what's the matter? Nothing. Can you show me that manifesto? Yeah, but they they took everyone's ID that bought one. Yeah, they were the FBI uh, collected it, mm-hmm. and they were they were following up too. Oh, they were uh, following people in Sa- uh, San Francisco where I thought he was based. They had they followed every in- single person who bought a copy of the paper. He w- um the reason Brad said San Francisco is because a couple of different bombings happened there. Mm-hmm. Well, what the deal was was the ho- homeboy lived in the cabin. But would take the bus to San Francisco. Just to pop him in the mail. And then take the bus back. That's how wicked this freaking guy was like planning this out. He's a smart dude. Whew. Well, when they eventually served the warrant, they tricked him into kind of opening up the door and just grabbed him real quick. Uh, They found him unkempt with lots of bomb making materials and 40,000 handwritten journal pages. And lots of those journal pages were full of basically him saying, like, here's the Unabomber attacks and here's how I'm doing them. (laughs) Like, it was no question if it was him or not. It was definitely him. He had notes that he kept in a special cryptograph, cryptogram. Code. Yeah, that he had, um, you know, put together that had uh, messages, like almost like a journal. Mm -hmm. And... um, they were deciphered, but the reason they said that they hey, he had them in that code was in case someone had discovered his cabin and went in, that it was in that code. So I wonder if what you're saying was that there had been translated. Some of it, yes, I okay, think. Some yeah. of it, no. Cool. Um, when you say bomb building material, you're saying like like chemicals that mix with this chemical mm-hmm. combined make this bomb. Yeah, like smokeless powder. Um, pipe parts, pipe caps, uh, electrical wire, soldering iron. Yeah. If you don't have electricity, uh, why do you have a fucking soldering iron? Hey, I work on guitars, man, and yeah. amps, bro. Like, How do you plug them amps in? Gary Wright gives lessons out here. Acoustic, up above fire. Up above fire. Up above fall. Up above fire. Upper. Upper. Mount Towner. Mount Towner. Upper. That's my Upper. favorite. Upper. Well, speaking of upper in Montana, up there in Montana, Montana. nice teamwork. We held hands and did that one. An arrested Kaczynski was indicted uh, April 1996 on 10 counts of illegally transporting, mailing, and using bombs. I don't know how you legally mail, use, and transport bombs, but I should know. He illegally did it? Yeah, illegally transporting, using, and making bombs. Um, well, also, three counts of murder. Don't don't forget the three counts of murder. Legally making a, a transporting a bomb would be like shooting a missile at, across the ocean, like at a country. Mm-hmm. I think that would be legally sending a bomb. It is true. The state does have a monopoly on violence. 
But if you're in North Korea and you try to shoot a missile, that would be illegally transporting a bomb because you're not allowed. <laughs> I'm not a North Korea fan or anything, but I think that's pretty funny that they're not allowed. Like yeah, everybody's all, it allowed. It all relies on <laughs> Every, your perspective. Everybody's allowed. North Korea. North Korea is like we can't. But every you you alone do five hundred tests a year. We just want to do ten. <laughs> and we're the only ones who've ever used them on people before. If anybody shouldn't be allowed to have nuclear weapons, is shouldn't it be the only people who have ever used them on people before? Just saying. <laughs> oh Jesus! Just Brad, throwing that out. Brad, there. stop. I got to get on your chest and start pushing on your ribs. Come back. I'm just saying, if you're going to bar people from having nuclear weapons, who do you bar? Remember when we did the World War II episode? And uh, no, it, we, were, we were like, um, I think I brought up, well, we're not, you, you, you agree to this treaty and we won't bomb you. And they're like, all right, fine, we won't do this thing. And then we still bombed them like Hiroshima. Mm-hmm. The other thing about it, too, is fucking, uh, is there really a difference between a nuclear bomb and, say, carpet bombing? Because I don't really think so. I'd probably rather just get vaporized by a nuke than have to suffer through, like, what Dresden, Dresden endured in World War II or fucking London You know what's, Blitz. You know what I'm thinking is, like, I like I'm an, I'm an animal person. Mm-hmm. I'm not really a people person, like, as far as, like, fans of. What kind of animal are you? I'm more a fan of a, animals than I am of people. But uh, I'm thinking like nuclear is literally a shame that all these animals will also suffer because humans are at war against each other. Like deer, like amphibians, birds, like whatever, like, you know, like radioactive shit that the the earth will be covered in. Everything's going to be fucked up because like humans like fucked everything up. Like that bums me out about the nuke. Fuck the people. Like, go ahead and fucking wipe out a few million but uh, look into the neutron bomb no Thanks. that'll still kill animals i mean just saying carpet bombing would kill people but it won't like destroy the earth forever right it's just uh look flammable up, look up in france they call it the red zone what nothing grows there anymore or what there's so much live ammunition that you're not allowed to go there so that it there's because there's like a real chance that you're going to die. You're going to step on something and it's going to blow up and you're going to die. So there's animals. I doubt there's that many walking around the red zone. Those are conventional weapons, non-nuclear. I don't know. The, the, the message is, is Let's just it's probably a dumb bombs. idea to kill each other on an industrial scale. There's probably never going to be another good reason to do it. Just saying. Just turn off each other's lights or something. We're going to disable electricity in the whole like country. We give. We give. All right. You What'd won. You yeah, yeah, no one had to die. You still fucked us. Well, Pass talking it. about getting fucked. Oh! Kaczynski's lawyers tried to pull a fast one on him once he was in there. He's a smart guy, a genius. He He doesn't need to be a lawyer to represent himself in court, does he? He wanted to. He did. Please tell me about it. They fucking were like, nah. We don't don't want a circus. No, nope, you can't. Um, And his lawyers tried to put in an insanity defense on his behalf. They're like, talk about those times you cried when you were doing therapy at Harvard. So he talked about it and they're like, see, he's crazy. They tricked him Mm -hmm. into saying that. Yeah, he tried to, and when they wouldn't let him represent himself, he tried to hire a new team of attorneys that had agreed beforehand not to pursue an insanity defense. And the court was like, nah, you got lawyers. You can't fire them. You can't hire these new ones. And you can't represent yourself. And they're definitely going to put it in this insanity defense. And if you don't like it, we're going to throw you into a a mental hospital where they're going to forcibly administer you drugs while they observe you. Enjoy your new life. Yeah. Oh, he he must have been just a super happy guy then, eh? Yeah. Some (laughs) some of the psychiatrists who examined him, not all, some of them diagnosed him with paranoid schizophrenia. (laughs) However, doctors who spoke with him after his imprisonment uh, referred to that as, quote-unquote, a ridiculous and a, quote-unquote, political diagnosis. So he pled guilty. Well, can I bring up a detail on this? Sure. They 
there during this whole trial thing, mm-hmm. the FBI picked up Ted, took him out of the holding jail, drove him to a warehouse, mm-hmm. entered the warehouse, turned the lights on. They freaking by. They moved his cabin from the woods in Montana mm-hmm. with a helicopter lowered onto a flatbed semi truck all the way. His cabin was in the middle of this warehouse, and they let him out there. Go ahead, go fucking walk around in it, man. It's like six by nine. <laughs> like 10 by 12 spin around in it man like spin around 360 you want that it. tour you're done yeah hey yeah. took a look look see and uh they're like look that whole manifest your uh your defense people are gonna say that you are crazy mm-hmm. unless you admit that you did it and you're guilty mm-hmm. uh then if, if you don't do that then your, your people are just gonna say you're crazy now every single word of that manifesto that you wrote that's wrote in you know, with the intention of being written by an intelligent person mm-hmm. is now going to be written by a crazy person. Exactly. And he was like, all right, you got me, you fucking FBI. God damn it. You win. Guilty. <laughs> yeah, because it, uh, that was his choice, basically. Uh, abandon your philosophy. Let it be tainted by a diagnosis that you don't have or just go to prison. Because the FBI really does not want to let this go to a legit trial. I mean, think of Ted Kaczynski is a genius. Yeah. He can maybe outsmart some jurors. He can outsmart some lawyers. Do you think in the United States, in case you're an international listener of this program, you're generally in a criminal trial before 12 basically random local citizens that get screened heavily by all the participating attorneys, but basically just 12 randos will decide your fate and it is binding for the most part. Oh, it's a blast being part of the interview process as well. They make you wait in a building, no phone for, yeah, ah, it's really no, you sucks. can go, you don't, even, you're done. You can go home. Like I didn't even get to go in the courtroom. Cool. Yeah. But, uh, all he's got to do is convince one one that he didn't do it one out of 12 the random people of the citizenry and they have to if they want to try him again they have to start completely over from scratch brand new trial and they almost never do that i bet you in his case they would have but if all 12 of them say he's innocent he's done he's out on the street the next day if he, he could literally walk, if all 12 jurors say he, he's innocent, he could literally be like, thank you, I did it, and walk straight out the front doors, and nothing, they could never do anything to him about it again. They could sue him, but he owns a 10 by 12 shack that's in the middle of a warehouse right now, and that's it. Yeah. Does this look like the normal living of a normal sane person? They were going to say that kind of shit. Mm-hmm. He's crazy, you guys. And, you know, talk about crazy. He was eventually where he is now, serving eight life sentences without the possibility of parole at ADX Florence, a supermax prison in Florence, Colorado. Former inmate before his execution, Timothy McVeigh. Another friend of his in there was the guy who did the first uh, uh, World Trade Center bombing. Oh, really? Yeah. I think his name was, uh, I can't remember. Yeah, it was like a total, it was like in the basement. He tried to do it from the ground up. Yeah. Like, it was like a small amount of people dead, right? Like 20s mm-hmm. or 20 or 30 or something? Or wasn't like 1,000 or nothing? Yeah. I don't know. I have no clue. I'm just trying to remember. That's more or less where the story of Mr. or Dr. I'm sorry, Kaczynski ends. That's where he is. That's where he's going to be. But a couple interesting little tidbits. Um, the University of Michigan Special Collections Library houses Kaczynski's personal correspondence with over 400 different people. And you can bet that there's people with a public persona amongst those 400 people because they have decided to keep the identities of who he was talking to and in those letters sealed until 2049. After those people are long dead. Yeah. 
that's when they'll say who it was. So I'm, I wonder who the hell it was. I'll be 70 something. Right? No. I'll be 60 something. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> 70. I'll be 70 something. I'll be, be 80. 80 something. Oh my God. Yeah, so you might not. I'm not going to say definitely not, but you might not hear those names on episode like 10 billion of this podcast. We got, it's going to be a long time, but I don't know if we got that much legs. I don't know if we have 50 years worth of episodes here. We're not going to touch base once they're released. <laughs> we Welcome will. Back. Welcome back. What'd you say? What? Fuck it. You're going to speak up, Bradley. Fuck it. Let's do it. We guarantee that when those names are released, we will release an episode of this program, probably like directly to your fucking brain. So don't forget to resubscribe when like 2050 computers are coming out. We're going to just pre-record all kinds of phrases and sentences and names and words. And like, we're going to have names from that era of U of M staff that like dinner and health staff can like edit together to yeah. make it sound like we're saying oh and it better be fucking better at it in 80 years from now humanized boop it was so and so professor of, oh, it's all pure, pure smooth tidbits yeah oh yeah the next one that i was thinking of is that cabin that they used for um evidence was seized by the federal government and is now on display at the museum in Washington, D.C. You can go mm. look at it. I heard they put a toilet right in the middle of it. Now it's an outhouse. That'd be big, funny. It's about as big as a nice size outhouse. Maybe like an outhouse with like a jacuzzi tub oh, in it. Oh, yeah. That would be awesome awesome an outhouse that you could like sit and chill in in a hot tub steamy hot tub in an outhouse that's why nobody could ever <laughs> let me design a house don't if i'm ever find myself in the position stop it because i'll design a house to be funny and i'll do that i'll design an outhouse with a jacuzzi in it and just to make sure people get the joke and they have to laugh at it i won't put a fucking bathroom in the house i'll shit in your jacuzzi boom oh i'd kill you for that i'll put death to pigs spray painted on the wall and blood spray painted with blood yeah because i have blood in the spray paint can i'll spray with blood well simple everyone knows how to do that fill a can up with blood i have nothing to say in response to that you don't have to the other thing this is this is the real capper i think is uh 2012 kaczynski responded to the harvard alumni association which evidently i assume via an automated system had reached out to him about the 50th reunion of the class of 1962 dear ted yeah welcome we we anticipate your we look forward to seeing you yeah he listed his occupation as prisoner and his eight life sentences under the awards heading and mailed their like, little mailer back to Harvard. I wonder if they put it in the fucking circular for that reunion. After I graduated high school years later, I, like a lot of us, we all got a phone call on like landline mm -hmm. and it was like, Hey, we're putting together wind out alumni a directory. So like people know like where you're at, what you're up to, like what your job is. And like, I'm like, seriously. And they're like, yeah, I'm like, Oh who's shit. Wheels are turning. Yeah. I said I was a pro angler slash magician, <laughs> right? Now, w without even knowing this, my current wife told them that she was a pro surfer. And we're from Southeast Michigan. I'm like Lake yeah. Erie, okay? Yes. Well, Detroit, you guys. And uh, it's just funny. And then someone ran into her later like, oh, my God, I remember seeing your name in the directory. And it was pro surfer. It was so funny. Like, we didn't even know we both did it, but we both oh, did that's, it. Oh, that's, that's, you guys oh. are just a pair, oh, ain't you? Yeah. Just two peas in a pot. Mm -hmm. Sorry, ladies. As the, as the, the famous quote from the movie, Hand That Rocks the Cradle, there's a, only one woman for me. And then Peyton responds with, that's how it should be. Not saying which woman it should be. That's some creepy. Oh, and right the rocks the cradles fresh in my brain. I just watched it. <laughs> People are thinking like, man, this guy really likes Rebecca De Mornay films. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Ted Kaczynski, Dr. Ted, the Unabomber, 
There he is, rotting away, ADX Florence. Good episode. Yeah, this was a fun one, Dr. Ted. Again, uh, we've said it in past episodes lately that if you have a suggestion for a serial killer, we want to do one every three weeks or so, once a month. Mm -hmm. So there's so many. I mean, we can do them forever, so we're going to do them more frequently. Please send them yeah, your suggestions. If you your got suggest. serial, serial killer suggestions, let us have it. Yeah. Um, and when you're out there, if you've had enough, if uh, like one of our best friends, Maria, out there, if you've had, a, if you run out of current episodes and you're all through the back issues, make sure to go check out our fellow podcast, Video Store Rewind. They'll hit you with the nostalgia from the 80s and the 90s, all the tapes you used to rent. It's a great show. Love those guys over there. Yeah. Thank you, Zach, for that uh, Farmer Jack offer. Suburban like, Commando, the yeah. latest episode. Pretty funny shit. I love that show. And another podcast. I don't know, Scotty. Woo. Shakecast. Oh, man. Latest news from their camp. They're changing their name, which is cool. Except they mentioned Dronecast. I don't know, because he likes flying drones. Mm-hmm. They're going to do a drone-based they just, program? They said, like, off the like on a whim. I don't think they were serious. Mm-hmm. I was just thinking, like, if you I don't know if there's enough material there. But I'm just saying, like, drone isn't a good word for a show that where people are talking. Because, like, droning is like, oh, let's go ahead and stop droning on. Yeah, on. it has oh, a my. boring connotation. Yeah, I would not do drone. Please don't do that. Do something badass. Yeah, but if, when, if, if and when you do decide on a new one... We'll let you guys know. Right now, check them out under ShakeCast. They're great. That's it. Thank you, band. Oh, they sound incredible. Can you hear them? They are just crushing. We're on all social media except Instagram. Yet. I haven't done it yet. Yeah, that's possible. Future, future's open. Oh, thank you. It. Thank you so much to this audience. You've been great tonight. We love having you down here at the studio. Can't beat it. Thanks, Thanks to the, the Thanks. listeners at home. We love you. Thanks to the listeners not at home, like I'm not going out on a walk, maybe. Yeah, maybe you're on a drive. Could be working. Kayaking. A hike. Shit. Thanks to our listeners. Who knows? On the space station. Could be. You never yeah, know. You never know. Yeah. I want, where would that show up on SoundCloud stats? I'm not sure. Don't know. NASA. It says NASA. It says, like, space for location. Sweet. Thank you, space. Good night. Okay, you've got 15 minutes, Mr. Kaczynski. So wait here and I'll bring your brother. Thanks a lot. All right. Oh. Well, <laughs> it isn't my brother David. Good to see you. Yeah. Wish I could invite you up to my log cabin, but there's about 136 FBI agents using it this weekend. Yeah. Go I, figure. Hey, I, I, I know. <laughs> <laughs>